I want to welcome you all here tonight. Say hi. hi. Thank you. Thanks for coming to this program. I don't even know what program number it is because these days, this year, I'm on the road every seven to 10 days for this entire year doing a program somewhere in the United States. And so I do want to just welcome you. And for those who don't know, hi, somebody said tonight, there's only one Stu. There he is back there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so yes, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I, too, have multiple sclerosis. That's what prompted me to get started with all this, because it wasn't there when I was diagnosed years ago, and I wanted to provide this to you. Tonight, we are funded by, funded, when I say funded, we were given a grant by Teva Neuroscience to do this program tonight. We cannot do our programs without the income that we get from the pharmaceutical industry, and I hope that you all can thank them as well, that thank Teva Neuroscience for doing this tonight. Thank you. You know, we recently were given a blessing come our way. I mean, MSVUs and News is trying to find ways to expand. And we did a gala a few weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale. And attending that gala that we heard just a few days prior was Miss Teen Broward. She and her mentor decided to come to our program. And then during that fundraiser, she was telling me that her platform now, until she goes for Miss Florida, is MSVUs and News. Okay, that is huge. Okay, she is going to be doing things with children that either have MS or whose parents have MS. She has taken on another child that does fundraising for us during the course of the year. She and he are going to start doing fundraising events for MS Views and News. She is creating a website that she will work with our tech people on tying into our website. She is coming up with this whole design of the things that. She, she wants to do, her name is Michelle Luce, and she is Miss Teen Broward, okay? And, you know, thank you. And, thank you, thank you. And, you know, this is really, really big because everywhere she goes now and the media follows her, our logo has to follow her too. So it is great public awareness. I am very thankful that she, her parents, and her mentor wanted to do this for MS Views and News. And so you're going to be seeing a lot of her. We're going to bring her around the state. Maybe, you'll, maybe we'll get her to the Tampa area sometime next year because that's exactly what she wants you all to see is what she is doing and why she is doing it. Okay? Great. Now, I don't want to take up more time. We've got a lot to do tonight. We have two speakers tonight. One is Jeff Siegel, and he's a personal trainer. And Jeff does a lot of programs with us in the state of Florida and is now traveling with us outside the state of Florida to do programs because when he's not working with us, uh, showing you all how to combat spasticity, he comes here and he speaks with you all about healthy nutrition and how you can do better for yourselves with MS and how it, you know, just how to have more energy during the course of the day will come from what he teaches you of or speaks with you about concerning nutrition. Then following Jeff, we're going to do a quick Q&A. Following his talk, we're going to do a quick Q&A. And then following that, we're going to have Dr. Gandhi, who I'm sure that all of you are here for tonight. Dr. Gandhi is going to speak with you about the effective communication that you could have with your healthcare team. He'll speak with you about some of the medications, and then we'll do a Q&A with him as well. If you are not comfortable asking you a question because you're afraid of these cameras, just know that you're in a great state. You could speak like Minnie or Mickey Mouse. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll see you more later on. We have Dr. Chetan Gandhi, and I'm sure many of you already know of his determination and what he has for the MS community. And so I would like to thank him for being here today. And let's educate. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, for everybody, for coming out. Um, I was hoping that Dr. Google would put me out of business a long time ago, but it still hasn't happened. I was looking to retire, but it's not going on. Um, so today we're going to try and touch on some topics. Um, I want to talk about the idea of how you talk to your physicians and how you talk to each other and how, how you have to approach the idea of having a chronic disease. This is what we're really talking about. All right, so that's kind of the outline. I'll give you guys a second to read. Read amongst yourselves. Have a sip of coffee. Read. All right. So we're going to talk about access to care and how to about MS, the MS relapse, all the different things. DMTs. We're going to go over a lot of them. Okay. 
So these are usually the questions that everybody likes to ask whenever they come in and they ask, they, I have to tell them that they have MS. Or if somebody else tells them they have MS, this is what they come in and they often ask me, what's that? What is it? How do I get rid of it? Am I going to die? That one is very common. Am I going to die? How did I get that? Am I going to be disabled? Am I going to be in a wheelchair? And my answer to all of that, well, I can explain the what's that. That, that part I got. And what is it? I can't get rid of it. Um, you're not going to die. And then the rest of it, I'm, I usually say, I don't know. And anybody who tells you for certain that this is how you're going to be, turn around and run away. Because they don't have a clue. They don't know. Nobody can predict the future. Nobody can tell you about your disease. And you know your body the best. Lesson number one. OK. So when the patient's in my office and they're sitting there and they're staring at me, you get this glazed look over your eye. Right? That's what it feels like. You feel like you've just been hit and run over, and you're like, what does this mean? My life, I have all these plans, I have all these things going on, I want to do this, I have children, I have family, I have a job, I have a career. What does it mean? And so I don't expect them to take everything in. I try to keep it simple. I try to give them just the bare minimum of basics, because I know that they're not going to keep everything. There's no way. I could sit there and talk, and those of you who've seen me in clinic or seen me out and about know I can talk a lot. I can talk endlessly about MS, and I can go on and on and on like a broken record. My wife usually breaks out the duct tape at that point and tries to tape my mouth shut. But the fact is, is that I don't expect everybody to really hold on to it. So I tell them, look, if you want to record something, bring in your recording device, start recording it, because I would have a hard time remembering it. And most of the time, when I go to see my doctor, I walk out and I was like, what was that? Oh yeah, well, I'm a doctor. It's fine. I'll figure it out. Um, so I tell them, you can record it. Now, if you're seeing a physician, always ask for permission. There's legal issues at play there, so you want to get their permission before you tape record them. The other thing you can do is take notes. Um, it's hard to do that. It's hard to keep writing, especially if you're talking to me, because I talk a mile a minute. Um, bring a friend. Bring a significant other. Um, but don't bring your whole family. I've had patients come in with 12 family members, and it's like I'm being, you know, interrogated by everybody and they're all firing questions and somebody's on a cell phone and they're firing questions off the cell phone and I'm like, can I phone a friend? Can I get some help? Um, I actually tell my nurse, I'm like, you're going to have to come out and get me. I'm going to need to like take a, take a bathroom break and take a cup of coffee and like go back in there and, you know, wage war yet again. Um, and for the most part, take in what you can. Uh, ask for resources, and we, you guys basically hit on the idea of asking for resources. I mean, the key thing is, is you want good resources. Dr. Google is not your friend. You may encounter all these Russian hackers and all sorts of craziness out there. Um, you know, there's all sorts of blogs, and they have all sorts of things, and they're going to tell you about this miracle cure that if you eat, like, a whole bottle of canola oil, you're going to get rid of your MS. And the truth is, is that, number one, that's disgusting. Number two, it's not real. So you really want to stick to the reputable sources. And I usually tell people, like, try the Mayo Clinic, try National MS Society, try, I have to plug. Here's your plug. Where'd you go? MS Views and News. You can also see this. This is going to be recorded. I'm on camera here for you guys to look at later. And you want to try and stick to that. And then, you know, the support groups are really good. Um, I usually preface that with everybody comes in and they have all sorts of things. Like, I look at other people and I'm worried about being in a wheelchair. I'm going to have this problem. I said, look, you're not going there to see your future. You're going there to find out the tricks of the trade. You're trying to find out what it's like and how to live and how to exist. And everybody's got great ideas. And as much as I share with my patients, they bring a lot to me. And I go, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to share that with more patients. So these are the things you can do to, to really get a hold of it. And I tell patients, if you get home and you have more questions, let's set up another follow-up. You can call me. We'll try to go over as much as we can on the phone. Um, you know, the idea of treatment, if anybody's telling you you need to make a decision on treatment, they're like, hey, here's 15 treatments, go ahead and pick one. 16 treatments, pick one. Don't. Just tell them you need time. And I tell patients, I'm like, look, this is for you to take home, think about, read it, let me write all this down for you, think about it, and then talk it over with your family, talk it over with your support group. You know, do your own research. Really get comfortable with the idea of what you're going to get yourself into. Okay, the appointment's over. Where do you begin? What do you do now? Um, the first thing I tell patients is deep breaths. Do not panic. You're going to become a Zen master, and you need to figure out how to do that. So the first thing you need to do is not panic. 
like I said, you want to try and go to the reputable places, and I wrote down a few names there. Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, MS Foundation America, um, National MS Society. These are all key things. And they, if you have any questions, you can go on there, and they have Facebook pages. You can post. You can do all these different things. And with social media in the modern era, you can do a lot. You can get a lot of bad information. You can get a lot of good information. So you have to decipher and sit down and decide what you're going to use. And it's hard. It's harder now than it was when you had no information, right? Because you really didn't have to weed through sources. You just had your sources, and it was your doctor, and it was maybe a, you know, a society, and that was about it. But now it's good information and bad information. So I often ask my patients, what do you want to get out of this? And the question always is, is what is your mission? And so you, know, you go to everything you do, whether you see your lawyer or your accountant or uh, somebody to do construction on your house or anybody out there, and you have an agenda to your meeting. right? You go out there and you say, OK, this is what we're going to talk about in my meeting. This is what I want to ask. These are the questions I need to figure out. This is what I want to do next. And you really have to approach your doctor's visits the same way. Have an agenda. Have a book. Keep track of what you want to ask. Write it down. Okay, um, I tell them to focus, um, and so I often say when they have tons of questions and they work want to work on tons of things, what is the one thing today that if I fixed it for you, got rid of it, made it better, that your life would improve dramatically, and then let's target that, let's fix that, and then let's fix the next thing, and it's it's like climbing a mountain covered in mud in a rainstorm. You're going to make strong gains some days and you're going to slide backwards and you're going to go sideways and the mud's everywhere and everything's flying but you slowly work your way up the mountain step an inch a step at a time and then you get there and so that really has to be it and my agenda for my patients is simple we need to fix something today what do you want to fix what do you need to work on what's going on how can i help you own your disease i often joke that you don't suffer from MS, make MS suffer from you. Make it rue the day that it came into your life. And really, the best way to do that is to control your own destiny. Control your own, control your own information. Try to own that. Ask the questions. Get your answers. Be the most knowledgeable person you can about your disease. Because it is individual. It is very individual, what you experience. And then you decide, based on that, what are your goals of treatment? What do you want to accomplish in, in your overall long-term agenda of what you want to see in 20 years, 30 years from now? And that's no different than if you had diabetes or any other auto, you know, non-autoimmune disease or autoimmune disease. You want to have a strict goal, a strict way of, of trying to measure your success and what the success of, of your care team is. And don't come see me without an agenda. I'll kick you out of the office. I tell everybody, you're the captain. All right. Long ago, the days were that I would wag my finger, swear up and down, and the, everybody would have to do what I say. I snapped my fingers, and you had to go home and do it. You lie to me and not do it and tell me you did do it, and we'd go back and forth for a while. That's no longer the case. I tell my patients, you suffer from this disease. This is your disease. You're going to beat it. I'm going to help you do it, but I'm not, I'm not the decision maker here. You are. You, I am your co-captain, I am your assistant captain, depending on how much you like me, I, you know, I can go all the way down the list. I could be the last guy on the team. I don't, it doesn't matter. But you know, the rest of your family is part of that team too, and I say get them involved. You know, if you have young children, that's a little bit trickier, but if you have older children that can understand, you want to get them involved, you want to explain to them what's going on, the family, the same story, and now you have a group of people to bounce things off of, talk about it. They know what's going on with you. They know that you're having a good, good day. They know you're having a bad day. And they can help you have good days. And that's the important part. The team also includes your primary care doctor and other specialists. And I often tell my patients, give your primary care doctor my card. Give your specialist my card. They want to talk to me. They can just pick up the phone and call me. I will talk to anybody that you give me permission to talk to about your condition and help them care for you. Because if your wellness is there, if your general health is good, then you will do better. It's a fact. So just as he said before, you have comorbidities. Everybody's allowed. My favorite thing is they, everybody comes in and they're always like, everybody tells me it's my MS. And I say, well, MS patients are allowed to have whatever they want. You know, you can have whatever condition you want. So you're allowed to be sick with other things. Nothing is always just the MS. So keep that in mind. Plan your visit. I already said this. Write down all your questions. Write down all your symptoms. And I tell patients the best way is information. Information is the key to everything. So I say, 
you know, if we're going to figure out what's going on and what the cause is of everything that's going on, is it your MS? Is it something else? Is it your diet? Who knows? Well, let's keep a journal. Let's figure out what's going on on the good days to make it a good day. Let's figure out what's going on in the bad days to make it a bad day. And then we can get a pattern and we can see what the, con the offending agent is and get rid of it. Wash it out and get, get it out of your life. You know, and then you decide on what's the big obstacles. You know, I sit down and they tell me, you know, I'm missing three injections or I'm missing three pills or it's hard for me to get to my infusion. And we try and figure out how to make that happen. What can we do to help you remember? What can we do to help you get there? Maybe we can figure out a friend that you can call to get a ride or somebody to remind you to take your pills or something along those lines. Um, and you, you keep in mind that you can't fix everything on one visit. I tell everybody, I'm like, look, I'm not a miracle worker. I like to believe I am, and I like to pat myself on the back and tell myself how great I am, but I can't fix everything in one visit. So prioritize your questions and your symptoms. Figure out what's most important. Figure out what the biggest deal is. Focus on the big things, and then slowly work down to the little things, and then you just fine tune it, and you've got your life where you want it to be, and it's in your hands. And then you control the information between your doctors and the other doctors. Don't rely on them to, to always talk. So sometimes doctors don't pick up the phone. You know, we're lazy too. We're la <laughs> we, we work hard, but we can be very lazy at times and not really go that extra mile to pick up the phone. And so I, I tell them, you know, take the piece of paper, take all that information. When you go to see your next doctor, this is what we told you. These are the medicines you're on. And know what you're, what's going on. Know what changes you're making. Know what drugs you're on. And if you know this and you control this information, that's half the battle. Be honest. So I've had patients show up and I talk to them and I reason with them and they've, they're like, yeah, that sounds great, I'm going to do that. And then they don't show up and they don't take their medicine. And I often laugh and I said, look, you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is up to you. I can't, I can't force you to take your medicine. And the medicine that stays on the shelf is the medicine for sure that doesn't work. So you've got you've to be honest with what you want to achieve and what you want to do. And sometimes your doctor may have a better idea for you and say, look, if you're averse to this treatment or this medication or something else, maybe there's another, op another thing we can do, something else, something different. Maybe there's something non-pharmacological we can try. And so I'm pretty open, as most doctors would be, to the idea of I don't want to take medicines, I don't want to do this. Well, all right, let's talk about it. Let's figure out a solution. If you don't want to take medicines, that's fine, but let's at least monitor, let's keep track of things to make sure that you don't get any worse. And if we do, if you do get worse, we, we're on top of it. We catch it early, we fix it, and then we you know, go a different direction. Don't lie to a doctor about following his recommendation or her recommendations. It will hurt my feelings if you tell me that my recommendations suck, but that's okay. It's, it's part of life. And if you don't want to do it or you can't do it, and you're, you know, patients come in, they're like, doc, I'm going to quit smoking. I'm like, okay, look, don't promise me things that you're not going to deliver on. Let's start with the idea, have you thought about quitting smoking? And just start there and start slowly and we'll work our way that direction. But don't promise me that you're going to quit when in reality it's really hard to do that and I don't expect you to do it tomorrow. If you can't do what you're being asked for, always ask for alternative options. And my patients will say to me, look doc, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. And I say, okay, well, what can you do? Let's figure, out, let's figure out a solution. Because at the end of the day, we're here for your betterment. We're here to make you live your life on your terms and help you do that by whatever means you want us to. And so at the end of the day, I will sit there and I will give 100% to trying and commitment to trying to figure out the solution to a problem. And maybe I don't have it, but maybe, it, you know, maybe it's, it's something I need to wrap my brain around and come up with something. Or maybe by talking to me, you'll come up with a solution. But it's just a matter of time and, and uh, being honest. And so how do you end your visit? You always check your agenda. Make sure you hit your points. Um, make sure you understand the plan. Repeat it. If you, you're not sure, ask about it. The key things always are, when's my next MRI? What lab work do I need? And what meds are being prescribed? Why are they being prescribed? And be clear when you see your doctor again. When am I going to see you again? Three months, six months, what, do you, what, what should we do? And then know what you need to do between appointments and try to keep up with it. It's hard. It's very hard to do everything. But if you keep the couple of things, I think there's a slow progression towards the positive, And that's what direction we always want to head in. And this is the fun part, you know, everybody goes to the doctor's office and everybody's running late and everybody gets angry and screams and yells. And I often tell them, the patient before you was ill, they needed a little extra attention. And I think if you were sick, you'd want me to spend that, that time with you. So I tell patients, you got to be patient, you got to understand and anticipate them running late, bring a magazine, bring some extra work to do. Um, 
you know, if you anticipate them being late, that doesn't mean you show up late. That's important. Um, and bring things to occupy your time. Uh, everybody wants to help you, and that's why we're all here. So if you can, you know, the, the easier that is to keep in mind, the easier it is to not get bogged down with anger and other things that then can take away from your visit, and we can focus on, on the problem at hand. Um, and, you know, realize that everybody's sick, and sometimes it requires more attention or time than we expect. You know, we allocate 30 minutes to a visit, and sometimes it can take an hour. It can take an hour and 45. We may need to admit the patient to the hospital. They may need steroids. They may need all sorts of things, and they may be in a bad situation, and we can't just walk away from them like that. Our, our obligation is to help them, and so we just ask for patience. That's really what we ask. So. Where should I begin? And so I, I tell patients go home and start with the question, what is MS? And let's go through that. And then why is my immune system doing this? These are key points. And so we know that it is a chronic disease of the central nervous system. It's most common between the ages of 20 and 40. Its overall incidence is increasing worldwide. We're seeing more and more of it. Some would argue that we're just looking for it. Some would argue that we are now getting in areas and new viruses and Zika and chicken yunga and all these different things are happening that can lead to that. Um, there is a DR2 genetic predominance. Um, those of you who go to USF, I always joke and I say, see, Dr. Robertson, there it is. That's your predominance, but you'd have to know him, so probably don't. Both white and gray matter afflicted 500,000 cases in North America, 10,000 cases annually, and female to male ratios three to one. So everybody in this room has had something on that slide, I promise you. And the thing is, is that these are common, there's some common ones and there's some less common ones, and your, this is what makes your disease your disease. It is the individual basis of why your MS is the way it is. And so the common problems, vision problems, fatigue, bladder, gait, dizziness. It can be anything in the neurological system. And so as such, that also means when patients come in and they have all these symptoms, it does not necessarily mean they have MS either. And so I, I tell them if they're coming in and they're like, I have MS, I have all these symptoms. Well, hold on, let's just take a look at this. Let's start from the beginning and try and figure this out. It's an autoimmune disease. And so what we're talking about is that your brain is no different than the wires on the floor or the wires on the, on, and going to these lights. They are this cord in the center with the plastic wrapped on the outside. And so what this disease is doing is it's stripping off that plastic. And so now the nerve works, it's a wire, but it's not good at conducting electricity down the wire. And that's why you get your symptoms. And that's why these symptoms relapse and remit. Because when you're doing your best, they will conduct the best. And when your nerves are doing the worst, when you're tired, when you're hot, when you're infected, when you're you know, having a bad day and stressed out, you will be symptomatic. And that is the, the nerve getting a conduction block. It's not conducting electricity. And now all of a sudden you're symptomatic. And now all of a sudden you feel terrible. And so the first thing I tell patients to do is take a deep breath. Go back to the Zen master. Think calmly, drink some cold water, sit down, relax. Realize that it's going to be okay because you've got a doctor and they're going to help you. And so I say take 24 hours and if things don't go away, give me a call because that's the point at which we can start doing treatment. We can start considering what's going on. We do a lab workup. We check for infections. We do all the nitty gritty stuff that we have to do before we go to the steroids. The steroids really always should be the last resort. And I tell my residents this. I tell everybody I train this. Steroids are not the answer. And you know it. You go to the ER and the first thing they say to you is, oh, you've got MS. Here's some steroids. And it's like, well, did you look at me? Did you try to talk to me? Did you examine me? Did you check and see what's going on? Because it might not be my MS. But they'll often handle, hand you the steroids because that's their go-to response. But my job is to actually make sure it's not something else. If it's going to be your MS, I've got to prove that it's your MS. And I've got to make sure it's not something else causing your problems. And so the problem also becomes that you get this chronic inflammation, demyelination, and scarring. And so that scarring is the issue. And what we're starting to understand is not only is it the scarring, and your MRI just shows you the scars and the structure of the brain, but it doesn't show you what's going on at the cellular level. And we're starting to recognize that there's inflammation also at play, and that's making you symptomatic. And if we actually treat it and bring the inflammation down, then we can start to improve symptoms. Patients feel better. We know that their disease is treated. And so that's part of the problem as well. So, everybody's disease is individual. Severity and course is, is where we try and target 
and decide what treatment options we should pursue. And so the common markers of disease include your relapse rate, your disability progression. Are you having more problems than you did a year ago? Are you having more trouble walking? Are you having more trouble seeing? Um, what does your MRI look like? And the MRI is the thing I go to. It's my, the only thing I have that gives me a look inside your brain and gives me a straight answer as to what's going on and where it is. But I rely on these other things to give me clues and give me an overall picture. The other thing is it's an autoimmune disease. You did nothing. It's an environmental exposure, genetically susceptible host. So you have to have genetics. And so in the general population, it's 0 0.5, 3, 0 0.3 to 0.5%. If you're a first degree relative has it, then it's 3 to 5%. So it's 10 times that of the general population, but it's not truly what you see in a genetic population either, in that it should be at least 25%. And if you have an identical twin who has MS, your chance of getting MS is only 30%. So that means it's not 100% genetic, and as a result, you have to be exposed to something that sets the, the wheel in motion. You have a predisposition to it, you set the wheel in motion, and all of a sudden you got it. And so the the postulate is the Epstein-Barr virus is a lot of different viruses and then now people are postulating that maybe you have to come across two different viruses before you can get that trigger and we don't know why some people who have the genetic predisposition will trigger it and other people won't and so that's what we're trying to figure out now and that's really the answer we have to have is what is that trigger and why does it do it that was what's going to lead to an overall treatment and possibly even a, a cure. Some have argued that there could be a vaccine in the future where we give you just one vaccine when you have it and boom it retrains the immune system and you're done. That would be nice. I, and I tell my patients, I have no problem going out of business. I can do something else with my time. I'd much rather do something else with my time than have all my patients afflicted. I'd rather them come in and go, hey, look, I'm cured it. I'm like, good. Go enjoy your life because I'm going to go fishing. I'll see you later. So the genetics, I just talked about this, 0.2%, um, 3 to 5% in the first degree relative, and 20 to 35% in an identical twin. And so the subtypes. So let's go back to the beginning. How did MS get its name? Where did it start? Well, it started in 1863 with the famous French neurologist, the father of neurology, Dr. Charcot. And he did an autopsy on a patient that had these problems, and they would have these episodes where they couldn't walk or they couldn't speak and they couldn't do anything and then they'd suddenly get better and everybody was like well what's going on are they possessed i have no idea so he did an autopsy on them and he found that they had sclerotic lesions in their brain and they had multiple of them so hence the term multiple sclerosis and based on that moving forward the clinical phenotypes of how these diseases look was based on the clinical presentation. Because up until the 1950s and 60s, the way we diagnosed you was we took you, we threw you in a hot bath of water, we pulled you out, you're symptomatic, boom, you got MS. And it's terrible that we did this. We were barbarians back in the day. But um, you know, these were the things and the tools that we had. And then the lumbar puncture came, and then the CT scan came, and then the MRI came. And then we were like, well, what do we do with the MRI? We have no idea what this means. And we came up with the McDonald's criteria. Um, and that really gave us the basis of diagnosis. But now the type. So you have the benign. You get several years. You have one attack, and that's it. And then maybe 20 years go by, and you have another attack. And those are what they call the benign ones. I really don't think MS is benign, because we know that the relapses are just but the tip of the iceberg in terms of what patients experience, and that you can get more disease and atrophy and other things going on underneath the surface. Relapsing remitting is the most common type. Um, secondary progressive is what happens after relapsing or remitting. That's the point at which you start to decline. And we still don't really understand what exactly is going on. Is this now aging that has taken hold of somebody who's had this rapidly aging disease, um, and now that's what's causing their decline, or is this truly autoimmune? We're still working on that. There's a lot of people who still think that's autoimmune-based, but yet it doesn't have a treatment, which is kind of odd in my opinion. If it doesn't have a treatment, then there's got to be something else at play. Primary progressive, oh, I take that back. There is a treatment. I forgot about that. Their newly approved treatment for uh, secondary or primary progressive MS is Ocrevus. Right, get on the bus, Ocrevus. That's how I remember it. Um, and so now that's the first treatment approved for primary progressive. And it's basically the slope. You have this disability that comes, trouble walking. Trouble walking gets worse, balance gets worse, vision gets worse, and you just slowly progress over time. Some patients, it's a long time. Some patients, it's a short time. And so no treatment to date ever worked for that. And now we have Ocrevus. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. So this is the natural history. It's a very busy slide, so do not 
get distracted by it. But what we're talking about here is there's several layers. And so the pink or purple, whatever you want to call it, is the level of disability. Um, red is the accumulated bur burden, and the cognitive dysfunction is yellow. And so what you can see is this accumulation of disability, essentially, um, and lesions and dysfunction as the brain volume starts to fall off. And so what do we know about MS? And what we know about MS, or know about general population, is everybody starts to lose brain volume, get ready, 30. Sorry, I'm terribly sorry. At the age of 30, your brain starts to, to decrease in volume, 0.2% a year. This was very depressing. I'm now 40, so that means technically I've lost like 1%. No, 2%. Ah, that's, that's terrible. Um, so, what is it for an MS patient? Well, it's 0.7 to 1% for the severe cases. And so you can really look at that as if you start at 30 and look at brain volume by 80, you can reach a brain volume of an 80-year-old as early as 50. That's what I'm scared of. That's what worries me about my patient's conditions. And if I can take that curve, if I can treat your disease today and make that go away and make your curve the same as somebody else in the general population, well, then I've beaten the disease. If I've kept you on your two feet for 30 years and now you're 70 and you show up and you're like, I'm walking, I'm doing great. Well, then we've done. We've we accomplished the mission. And the mission is to keep you on your two feet doing you. And so if we do that, if we treat that, if we get to that point, now we're talking. This is what we've been after. This is what we haven't been able to do. And now we're talking about doing it. I'm now seeing 70-year-olds and I'm like, wow, you're doing great. They're like, what do I do? I'm like, enjoy your life. Don't come back and see me. You don't need me. You're free. Go. Go there forth. So the triggers to this disease, we still don't know. We think it could be environmental. We think there could be toxins. We think there could be viruses, allergens. We just don't know. And we're working on that. We just haven't found the answer to that question. It's not for a lack of looking. We've been looking and looking and looking. We just haven't, it hasn't made itself known, which means that it's multiple layers. It's confounded. It's got multiple factors. And so environmental factors. I told you Epstein-Barr virus, ineff inefficient exposure to mild infections early in life. This is the not sick enough hypothesis that we wash our hands too much. We use too much Purell. And I tell patients, look, getting sick is a good thing. It's normal. Your immune system is designed to do that. So the fact that you didn't get sick is probably not a normal thing. And more importantly, your immune system got bored. So it went on the attack, and it found something to go after. And that's not your fault. But it's just a sign of things to come, and we need to get on that and actually dial it back and make it normal. Um, the low sun exposure and low vitamin D levels, that's been the key. I think everybody's heard that. That's why there's a higher predisposition in the northern latitudes, in the Caucasian mountains. Um, that has been long thought, and we'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, and smoking. So now we've found that patients who smoke at the time of their diagnosis go into secondary progressive much earlier than those who do not smoke. So I tell patients, look, you can smoke. That is your right. I'm not going to tell you not to. However, it's better for your health, your overall well-being, and now you're double insulting your brain because we know smoking damages the blood vessels in your brain, and now you've got another illness that's damaging your brain, so you're just hitting it with everything you got. So that's not going to work. And that's the disp distribution, highest risk in the Canadian areas, um, in Germany, Sweden, Great Britain. And then you see it again down south, uh, below Australia. So that's where the least amount of sun occurs. So the vitamin D story. And so the vitamin D was long thought to be a vitamin, and it's really not a vitamin. Because a vitamin means it's vital, and you have to take it into your system in order to get it. And we know that vitamin D is actually synthesized by the body, which makes it no longer a vitamin, but a hormone. And recently we found that the vitamin D receptors on those T cells that are highly active. And so in Australia, they did a study and they were studying 100,000 patients and they were following them for all sorts of diseases. And what they found was there was a group of patients that came out with their first attack, clinically isolated syndrome. And they said, well, let's answer the vitamin D story. And they put half of them on vitamin D, 700 units, then they put the other half on nothing. And those that weren't on vitamin D went on to develop full-blown MS, while those that were on those who weren't on vitamin D went, to go develop, went on to develop MS. Those who were on it actually never had another attack. So vitamin D is a potent part of this. 
And so we now found the T cell receptors. What we found happens is it gets bombarded with vitamin D, it calms the cell down, and it goes from that TH17 attack mode to the TRAG25 cell, which is now modulating and just checking things out and just hanging out and not causing any trouble. And that's what we want it to do. So the way you do this is you're synthesizing it in your skin. So the next question is, well, why do patients who live in Florida get MS? And that's the great question. They're starting to look at the idea of maybe the enzymes don't work right, or maybe the way, maybe it's sunblock. Who knows? I don't know. And I'm not telling you don't wear your sunblock, because the last thing I want to see is get you guys get melanoma or something terrible. That's not what I'm after. And by no means should the sunblock people come after me. Like, I have friends who are dermatologists. If they heard me say that, they would probably hang me um, and kill me, because they always have sunblock in their purses. Um, but what, what it means is we need to figure out more about this and why this happens. So in the meantime, it's very easy to give vitamin D, and we start you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 2,000 units. And just as said before, I want to get that level, the studies showed 50 to 70 to be the right number. And patients tend to feel better, they tend to do better. And so you know, when you're fighting a war, which is what I call this, I'm going to use everything in my arsenal. And so I don't really care if it's diet, if it's vitamins, if it's whatever. I'm going to give you everything I got to make you function. And so vitamin D is that thing. And so if we can decrease and calm down the immune system via that, plus a medication, plus all the other things, then we should do it. So what is an attack? It's a change in neurological function that persists more than 24 hours. And the episodes last on average three to six weeks. And the length of episode is decreased by steroid treatment. Steroid treatment does nothing for the disease other than shorten the time to recover. All right. So everybody's like, oh, just give them steroids. Well, no, that's not the answer to the question, right? We need to figure out what this is. Is it truly an attack? And if so, what does that mean? Well, now that we have 16 treatments, the question is, did they fail the treatment? Did they miss a dose? Did the medicine not work right? Did something happen? Did a medication interfere with it? Did you have something stressful happen? Because everybody often tells me, right before an attack, something stressful just triggered it all. They had a divorce. They had death in the family. You name it. And so things often occur. They, they must not like me. It's okay, though. I know them. They, I've seen them before. They used to be my patients. When I was at USF before I left. Um, what is not an attack in MS? Any change in a neurological function that we can find due to other reasons. And so UTIs, URIs, other things. Um, it's called UTOF's phenomenon when you spend time in the sun and you get overheated. And now you, you get your neurological symptoms. Stress. We know this from stroke patients. And if you take a stroke patient who has a facial droop and you put them in a comedy show and you get them laughing, their facial droop disappears where you start arguing with somebody with a stroke who's had speaking problems and now all of a sudden they can't speak at all because they're so flustered and angry that their symptoms get worse. And so we know this from other conditions and we know this from MS as well. So I say to my patients, you are now a Buddhist monk. You must meditate and you must keep your cool at all costs. Do not yell at the guy in front of you in the car. Do not throw things. Just relax. Find your happy place and go there. And then I write scripts for my patients and I say, give this to your wife or husband and say, you must have three hours to yourself every week to relax and do whatever you want to do. And they cannot do anything to you about that. And you don't owe them anything for that either. So that's the important part. So the diagnostic criteria for our multiple sclerosis came out in 2010. We're going to have a revised version soon. There's supposed to be one in 2015. They haven't quite finished it yet, so we're supposed to expect it any time. The goal when we had the first was to try and figure out how to diagnose it. So you had to have eight lesions up here and nine lesions over there and ten lesions down there. And then we realized, well, wait a minute. This is taking too long. And we're sitting there and counting. Okay, they got seven here and they got six over here. Does that mean they don't have it? Well, come on. Stop messing around. So we decided, very simply, as a community, that you need one lesion in the, in the supertentorial or up on top, one lesion in the brainstem or spinal cord, and that's all you need. And you need them separated in time. So you need to have seen the one lesion is brand new and one lesion is old. And you can do that by history. So if somebody tells me, yeah, when in my 20s, my toes went numb, and they didn't come back for three weeks, well, that's an attack. Or I lost vision in an eye, an attack. And now they have another one. Well, I'm not going to wait around. I'm not going to wait around for them to have a second attack. I'm going to treat. I'm going to try to make sure they don't have a third attack, which is what we're after. And so this is basically the criteria. You can look it up online. I, it's a lot of science and other stuff that I, it's boring, so I'm going to skip it. Um, 
and this is even more boring. It's basically like, well, you gotta have two attacks plus two lesions, or you can have the lumbar puncture, which we don't really do much anymore, or you can have one attack and one lesion. And it's silly. That's a periventricular lesion. That's what's going on, and that's what we worry about. You know, you accumulate this, and this is connecting the brain, the top of the brain, your cortex that makes you you and makes you think and makes you move to the underside. This is where the wires go in. And so we're just basically disconnecting parts of the brain. And that's what we don't want to have happen. And if we don't treat it, then eventually, not only does it get demyelinated, but you cut the cord, and now that nerve doesn't work anymore. And then you get a black hole. That's our supposition, at least. And that's a juxtacortical lesion. And now what we know from MRI data is that I had a patient. He had an MRI. I diagnosed him. And he said, well, I said, it's time to get another MRI. He's like, OK. So he goes and gets an open MRI. And he goes, guess what? My MS is cured. It's gone. And I said, well, for humor, here's another MRI. Go get it done in a three Tesla machine. And so he comes back. He goes, what do you think? I'm like, well, your MS is back. I said, you didn't, you didn't keep up with the payments, my friend. Um, but that's the problem. And so when we got, went on to study it in seven Tesla data and seven Tesla MRIs, we found that we were missing lesions on the three Tesla MRIs. And so we know there's silent disease. We know there's disease we don't see. And so as a result, we have to be vigilant. And we have to not only rely on the, the MRI, but the exam, the history, 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 history. You're having new symptoms. You never had them before. Then this has to be a clinical attack. Let's just make sure there's no infection before we do anything. Because if I give you steroids and you have an infection and it's a bacterial infection, you get something called sepsis and you could die. So the most important part is to treat the infection and not get the steroids. So I tell my patients, do not call anyone else. Call me. I will order the tests. I will figure it out. I will talk, call the ER and make them understand. So infratentorial lesion is what that looks like. That's your cerebellum that controls balance, controls speech, controls thinking, it controls judgment, it controls a lot of different things. And you can get lesions there. And so when you have one on top and one on bottom, that's enough to meet that criteria. That is a spinal cord lesion. And so you can imagine, I can have all this area up in the brain, I can take a little dot of a, of a lesion, hide it in there, and you will never notice. But now, if you're dealing with something the size of your thumb, I put that same dot there, and now it covers a ton of real estate. And these lesions are symptomatic. These are the lesions that cause disability. These are the lesions that do the most damage. And so when I see this, this is no joke. This is what Aaron Boster up in Ohio talks about, the idea that if you were having a brain tumor, and it was a malignant cancer, I would pick up the phone, I would make everything happen, I'd move heaven and earth, and I'd get you into an oncologist's office the next day to get a biopsy to get treatment the next day. Why don't people do that for MS? And that's the million dollar question. Why don't they pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, Dr. Gandhi, got this patient here, had a bad attack, spinal cord lesion, they need to be in your clinic. Because I would say, send them over, I'll take care of them. But nobody reacts that way for MS, why? I mean, that's the, that's the thing we're trying to change. It is not a benign disease. It is not a disease that, quote unquote, in the old days, where the medicines can kill you, but the disease doesn't. Well, there's worse things than death. And it will kill you, eventually, because it'll disable you to the point where you can't move. And then you will succumb to the, the secondary effects of the disease. So we need to treat this aggressively. We need to be on top of it. We need to treat this like it's a cancer, like anything else, and get on it and treat it hard and fast from the beginning. There's no time to wait. And now we're learning more and more that if we treat early in patients in their 20s and 30s and treat them aggressively, we can actually prevent the damage and that the immune system over time will calm down on its own. We just need to buy the time. And so if we treat aggressively up front early, we then de-escalate therapy and go back to the interferons by the end of their, uh, their MS time. And then they gently step down and they have no disease. And now they're 65 and they're doing great. Well, then. I've done my job. I've, we've cured it. As a, as a community, we've cured MS. And that's what we should be after. So when we talk about enhancement, what happens in enhancement is those immune cells come in, and you have what's called the blood-brain barrier. It keeps things out of your brain. And it breaks down from that, in, that attack from those cells. And so the contrast coming in is that spot where the blood-brain barrier is broken down. It's where the cells are there. They're getting active. They're damaging tissue. And that's what that looks like. And that's why it lights up. And that's why gadolinium is important as part of evaluating a true relapse. That's what's going on. Memorize it, take pictures, learn it. I still can't even tell you what's exactly on this slide. I get a headache when I stare at it for too long. The bottom line is it's complicated. 
That's what this takeaway is. And there's a lot of different cells at play. And the immune system has like nine to 10 different cells that come in and they act like a perfect symphony and they release their chemicals and they do all these different things to come together to try and fight something. And when they're fighting bacteria or a virus or something else, that's awesome. But when they're fighting your own system, that is bad. And there's, a, there's an autoimmune condition on it for every organ out there, thyroid, you name it. Everything's got an autoimmune condition, which means that this is not an uncommon thing, but we need to be vigilant about it and get, get on top of it early. This is my pretty picture I made. So first the cell comes over, it gets activated, it binds to the wall, and then it rolls inward, and then it goes and it reactivates on the other side, now in the brain, and then it goes on the attack and it starts damaging tissue. And it's, it just thinks that that's an invader. It looks similar to something else you've encountered and now it thinks, okay, I gotta get rid of that, that's bad. So, how do drugs work? Well, we can do a lot of things. We can suppress or deplete those auto-reactive immune cells. We can sequester auto-reactive immune cells in the peripheral lymph node or lymphoid tissue. We can inhibit and autoreactive immune cells infiltration into the blood-brain barrier, and we can modulate cytokine activity by shifting the balance from a pro-inflammatory to an, to an anti-inflammatory state. And so that's, that's all the different drugs. I have 16 drugs now. Like 10 years ago, it was like a five-minute conversation. Now I gotta put in 60 minutes just to talk to people about drugs. I'm like, where'd my salary go? Well, it, it didn't change. So I'm like, well, okay, fine. I'm gonna allocate time for this. And so we're gonna talk about them all and we're gonna talk about them basically and we're gonna try and decide based on what you know and who you are as a person, what fits. So let's talk about the meds. So the approved injectable therapies, there's Rebif, Copaxone, Avonex, Betaseron, Extavia, and Plegridi. Um, and everybody's pretty aware of these, I would say. You've encountered the discussion about these or have taken these drugs at some point. They were called the, the platform therapies, the ABC drugs, right? And these were the medicines that came out first. They were the tried and true. And what they did was they took patients down from thir by 33% relapse rates. So if you had six relapse a year, you went to four and that was considered awesome, right? And some people went disease free, which was fantastic, but the population was small. They weren't, they weren't as robust as we'd hoped for. And then the question is, did we, get act did we address disability and brain atrophy? And the question question always becomes, maybe, maybe not. And so the Copaxone was probably the most prescribed treatment, and, and when it works, it works great. But sometimes disease is more active, and you need something a little bit stronger. And so if you look at their annualized relapse rate reductions, you can kind of see over time that they did reduce that. They did answer that question. Um, they did reduce GAD-enhancing lesions. They did you know, decrease disability pro uh, progression. And they decrease the number of new T2 and lesions and um, new enhancing lesions. So the biggest problem you have is injection site reactions. I mean, for a lot of these, it's really just a matter of getting it right. And so what do you expect from patients who never injected? You have to educate, you have to teach, you have to be on top of it. Um, with glutamic acetate, you can get a little bit of what's called lipoatrophy, so a little bit of that pockmark can occur. Um, and most, they've gotten rid of the category C's and B's for pregnancy, that's no longer an issue. Um, and the rest of it's kind of there. So interferon, the mechanism is not completely understood, but it came from the idea that we're interfering with the immune system, and that's where it started. And the idea is that we're gonna enhance the T cell activity, we're gonna reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines, and we're gonna downregulate these cells that then take that little piece that's part of you and present it to that cell and say, go attack this thing. Um, that's what we're gonna try to downregulate with these medications. And so again, we're talking about the adhesion molecule and getting across the periphery into the CNS. And so we're trying to block this. So glutamic acetate, um, or Copaxone, is a mechanism of action is also not completely understood. We know it's a four amino acid structure, so it's very similar to the, the natural occurring things. Um, it inhibits the activation of the T cell, um, and it competes, it acts very similar to your own myelin, so it acts like a, a, basically a red herring and tries to get the immune system to come after it. Tysabri. So Tysabri came around in 2004, and to date it was probably one of the most effective treatments 
at the time for MS. You saw a 70% reduction rate, and patients did really well with this medication. But the problem is, is that when we test it, we find these very perfect looking patients to try the drug on because we want to make sure we, we see the true effect of the drug without having any of these variables that can, that can answer it. And so these patients did great. And it wasn't until the drug came on the market that we found out about PML, and we got to this larger group of people. And so it was pulled in 2004, and it came back to the market um, with, the, with the touch program or the monitoring program. And so we check for JC virus as part of that. And what this does is it blocks the blood brain barrier. It does not let the cells across attack the brain. The problem is there's a virus called the John Cunningham virus. I don't know if it's a good thing to have a virus named after you. I, don't, I think that's kind of bad. But anyways, it's named after a patient who got this virus. And this virus, when, when you get immunosuppressed and when the HIV epidemic came around, we really got a good look at this it then goes active and it exists in 40 percent of people and most of the time you don't know it you had a little cold and it's there and it doesn't bother your immune system takes care of it but now that we're blocking the blood brain barrier the immune cell might not be getting in there at all and now we don't surveil and then you can get a terrible brain infection from it but that's how it works it binds to the icam vcam molecule and doesn't let it across um, so we talked about pml i just told you about it it affects the oligodendrocyte and it also leads to demyelination. So you're treating, I mean, that's the bad thing about it, right? It's that if you get this infection, not only do you have MS, which demyelinates, now you have an infection that demyelinates. And that's kind of the bad part of it. But it works really well. So that's the other side of it, too. So the risk. Um, so approximately 150,000 patients worldwide. We've had 1,056 deaths due to PML. Um, and nobody got it before the eighth dose. And so it's based on prior exposure, immunosuppressant therapy, and the duration you're on natalizumab. And this is the risk stratification. Gelinia is the S1P1 agonist. So what this does is it's very interesting. You have these S1P1 receptor thingies on your cells, and it's like a lock and key. So it has to go bind to something and then get out of the lymph node. So we said, well, let's just block these things. And so we block them, and they can't get out of the lymph node. And now they can't go to your brain and attack. So it works, and so it prevented patients from having relapses, and it drops the white cell count, but these cells are still active in the immune system, and they're still working in the lymphoid tissue where they're constantly surveilling and doing their job. They're just not in the blood. That's its mechanism of action. I'm sure you guys are all excited about this. You're like, I'm completely lost. Okay, let's move on. All right, so there's other issues you have trouble with. Um, because it's not isolated to just the immune cells. It is in the heart. It's on the SA node. So the first dose, you get this transient drop in heart rate. It can affect your retina. It can affect your lungs and your liver. So we're constantly monitoring. But we also think this is the effect of it preventing brain atrophy. And so that's part of the part of what it does is it decreases brain atrophy, decreases disease progression. It's a good drug, and, and, it, and it's done a great job. And it's a once-a-day pill. These are the key safety issues, and we've already talked about that. Um, you see a lot more infections because we're turning down the immune system. We want you to get infections, but we want you to get the normal viruses, run of the mill colds. We don't want you to get fungal infections. We don't want to overdo it and make you sicker than you need to be. So it's a balancing act. We're trying to balance everything out and make it all work. Teriflunamide, Abagio. Teriflunamide came about as a result of a drug called luflunamide, and it was used for rheumatoid arthritis. It was known as Areva. And what we know about rheumatoid arthritis is if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you have MS, and I treat you with a rheumatoid arthritis drug, it makes your MS worse. So that's terrible. And so what we found, though, was patients who were on the leflunamide for their RA, their MS got controlled. And so they looked into this, and they found that it gets converted to teriflunamide in the liver, and they found that was the active molecule. And what it does is it prevents these clone cells from rapidly dividing and making more clone cells that can remember MS, and we're trying to decrease these cells from multiplying and becoming active, and as a result, they don't secrete their cytokines and they don't wreak havoc. So that's part of it. The other part of it, too, that's coming about is that we now understand that this was a drug that was used to treat renal cell transplant patients to prevent them from having trans, uh, transplant rejection, but also to treat a virus because it has a weak antiviral property. Um, and it treats this virus called the BK virus. And the BK virus comes from a family of viruses called the polyoma virus, or polyoma family, uh, which part of that family is also known as the John Cunningham virus. So the question is, we've never seen a case of PML with this drug. Does it, in fact, decrease the rate of PML? Um, we're not sure, and we're looking into that. But there's some literature that supports that. 
dimethylfumarate. So this drug came about from Germany. This is, I mean, these are fun stories, to be quite honest, because I'm a nerd and being nerdy, just, it's cool. Um, so what happened was this was a drug used in Germany for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in patients with both MS and psoriatic arthritis. Their MS got controlled. They figured out it was dimethylfumarate that did this. We know that it decreased pro-inflammatory cytokines. It tries to shift the immune cells over. And it works on this pathway called the NRF2 pathway. It's a pathway that is an antioxidant free radical scavenge pathway. And so we think what it does is it goes through and scavenges out these, all these bad toxins and things that contribute to MS. Key safety issues, again, there's been cases of PML reported with this. Um, there's been four or five cases to date out of 100 or over 200,000 patients. So this is the pipeline, and now you can see what we're dealing with. And now we've just had three new treatments approved, Elemtuzumab two years ago, Decluzumab last summer, and then just recently Ocru Ocruluzumab. Acrevis, as it's known. There's other drugs coming, and these are all very promising looking drugs. Um, but we're going to talk about the three new ones now. So, elemtuzumab is the most aggressive treatment to date. And what we're essentially doing with this is we're going through and we're wiping out your circulating immune system. You're taking it completely offline, getting rid of all these cells, killing them all off. And then we're letting the immune cells that are in the bone marrow, the stem cells come about and come out and then start replicating and they don't have any memory of MS at that point. So they get five infusions over one week in year one and you get three infusions over one week in year two and then you're done. Free and clear for the next four to seven years on average from any relapses or any further disease progression. The good news is this, basically now the immune system comes back online after year two and it doesn't remember MS. It never, it's as if it never learned it. Now there's still things in the body that can relearn it and that's why it takes five to seven years to relearn it, but there are people out there that are going on 14 years without having a relapse. And so there is, this is, this is the age we're upon. The monoclonal antibody revolution has begun and we're gonna start targeting smaller and smaller components of the immune system and get better results with better safety. That's our hope, that's our prayer, that's what it looks like. So infections were common because obviously, as you can imagine, we're taking the immune system on offline, but we can treat for these sorts of things. Um, and so the other part of it too is that because of the way the immune system comes back online, these B cells come first. They don't have anything to tell it what to do, so it goes on the attack. And so 30% of patients get thyroid disease. Interestingly enough, thyroid disease runs commonly with MS. The other thing they get is ITP, and that's a platelet disorder where it attacks your platelets. We can give steroids and that will resolve that. And then they get nephropathies, problems with their kidneys. The interesting thing about the ITP and the nephropathy is it looks like it does in, in pediatric patients. So it shows the immunity, it shows the immaturity and the, the, how the, the immune system has basically gone back to childhood. And so that's the interesting part about it. That's my takeaway from it. So decluzumab, once monthly injection. Did you ever think you'd see a once monthly injection? But that's where we're at. Once monthly, it's a CD25. It does not affect the immune system directly, but blocks IL-2. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the idea that we're targeting smaller and smaller molecules and not going after the immune system directly. The end result is a less overreactive immune system and it's a once monthly sub-Q injection. These are the side effects. And so the monitoring is because they had a liver failure that went, that was kind of hard to pick up on, they'd recommend and it's basically a, a REMS kind of follow through that they're going to check your liver enzymes once a month while you're on the drug and for three to six months after you stop the drug. So now we're talking about the B cells, which this is a new development. We didn't, we are always like, okay, it's about the T cells, that's where the party is, but we're now realizing that B cells are part of it. And I think I would give credit for this to Tim Vollmer and his group in the University of Colorado, because they decided early on that they were gonna just use and treat with rituxan, which was the first B cell mediated therapy, and they saw a lot of benefit for their patients. And so what we're really targeting at this point is the immature to the plasma blast group of cells, and we're going to take them away, get rid of them. And we're just gonna take out this one component of your immune system. And they're the CD20 cells. 
And so these cells are the attack. They are the, they are the war machine. They show up, secrete antibodies, and they get to work. And they start the system off, and they start it, and they, they make it nasty. And so what we found is that by getting these cells offline, we can treat the disease, we can treat it, and we can treat it well. And it's a once every six month infusion. And so we don't even have to do any monitoring per se, but I recommend monitoring when I do this. I'm going to check cell counts at, at three months, every inter interim three-month period of time, make sure it's on the right track. So side effects, mostly it's the infusion reaction. Because when we're going in there and we're killing off these cells, they get all these things that they secrete when, they're, when you're infected that tell you you're infected. They give you muscle aches, they give you fever, they give you all these things. So when we get rid of the cells and kill them, they let go of all these chemicals and you feel crappy, for lack of a better word. Um, and so you have an increased risk of infection as a result of this, mostly upper respiratory tract, um, skin infections, things of that matter. And there were six cases of breast cancer that occurred with ocrelizumab. This is the general scenario. And so realize, when, you, when, you, when you're in clinical trial, if I stub my toe on this thing, they go, okay, so I had to put that in the PI because you stubbed your toe, you were on the drug, and the drug may have caused you to stub your toe. And I'm like, okay, does that make sense? Maybe. I mean, if, if it caused you to walk funny, sure. But so any little thing that you get into, if you get in a car accident, all of a sudden that gets put in there as part of this. So this is the list of side effects that can occur with ocrelizumab. If you read Tylenol, it's pretty scary. And Tylenol, by the way, is prescription in Europe. So when to switch? And this is really the key question, right? Like, what do we, when do I go to a new drug? And the question always is, and I always tell patients it's simple, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If your disease is stable, if you're doing great, why switch? There's no need to switch, you're doing great. Now, if there's a reason, like you can't inject yourself, you've got a lot of issues, or you've got a lot of problems, then the talk can begin. And if you're risk adverse, that's another reason to switch. But now we've entered into the new phase of MS treatment in the sense that we're talking about the term NIDA. And NIDA is no evidence of disease activity. It is no longer acceptable to see one new lesion on your MRIs. It's no longer acceptable for you to have an attack. It's no longer acceptable for you to accumulate disability. And so when we see this now, we are going to take a very aggressive stance on it and say, well, we're not going to wait around for another one. Let's move on to the next therapy. It's time to get control of your disease. It's time to make sure this disease doesn't, ha doesn't cause you problems. Let's put it on its heels. Let's kick its butt and put it out of commission. And so that's what we're after now. And now the new generation, I would say, is more aggressive at treating this disease because we know we can keep you doing you till your 60s. We can do it. And we can do it safely. And that's what we're after. Oh, I'm done. Was that really it? I'm done. Go figure. Awesome. I, to I told everybody I talked fast. I, I did not lie. I talked fast. So... Who's got the first question? I have a question. Um, you were talking a little bit about the genetic um, side of it. Yes. First, um, something. What exactly is that? And um, my my more my oh. main concern is my son. Okay. So mean, I think that so what sense. we know is that in the general population, it's 0.3 to 0.5 percent that can develop the disease. If you have a first degree relative, the risk is three to five percent. It's still low. It's still so low that we don't even recommend surveillance on family members. But when you look at it against the general population, it's 10 times the risk of the general population. So that number sounds huge, but still that no other number, 3 to 5%, is low, which means that it's not only just a genetic problem. It's too low to be a genetic problem alone. If it was a genetic problem, the minimum it could be is 25% in your family. So one out of every four family members should have it. So. My thought is you don't need to worry about your son. I mean, you, you want to always be vigilant, and if there's a new symptom, get it evaluated, but don't need to surveil and constantly be on having them get MRIs like, you know, every birthday, you know what I mean? Like, here's your birthday present. Go get an MRI. Hi. Um, I'm on Jelenia, and I mm -hmm. was just wondering. I missed a day, first time in three years, two or three years. And I was wondering if I'm still going to live. And the second question. You are a terrible patient. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And the Sorry. second question is, I saw that um, melanoma. Mm -hmm. OK, should you stay out of the sun with that stuff? Well, so the, the question becomes, what is the relationship of cancer and the immune system? 
right? And the problem is, is that your immune system is designed to do a lot of things. And so one of the things it does is it looks for abnormal cells, and that can be cancer cells. And so immune system keeps them in check and kills them off. So if I suppress your immune system, one would argue, or if I change your immune system in any way, modulate it, does that allow the cancer to grow faster? And would you have just had the cancer and now it's coming out more obviously than it would have? And my recommendation is you just do what you always should be doing, which is look at your skin, surveil it, see your doctors, let them take a look at it, take pictures of your of moles, things like that. But generally, I don't tell patients they need to stay out of the sun. I tell them to stay out of the sun because of their MS, but I don't tell them to stay out of the sun because of the medication. Question here. What is the status of the remyelinating medications? So antilingo was the main one that was doing that, and it's still in trial. It, in one trial, hit its endpoint, and another trial it didn't. It was mainly looking at optic neuritis. Um, we now have things like MD1003, which is the high-dose biotin that showed reversal of disability for primary progressive patients. So that's now in clinical trials. Um, and so that's, that's also something that's hopeful. But it's there, and it's on the horizon. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that I'm going to see it before I retire. Um, and if anything, if anything about this development of drugs has told me, it's that everything is going in fast motion. It's like a snowball. And at first it was like one drug every few years. Now we're just snowballing it and everything goes to trial. And if it shows promise, it keeps going. Yes, I believe you said that the spinal cord MS lesions do the most damage. If that's Correct. the case, this is the first time that we've gone to a seminar and seen an actual spinal cord in the program. And if that's also true, is there a specific medication that will work more so for the lesions in your spinal cord or does all of them work? They all work. They all work on spinal cord lesions. It's just a question of do other things have better statistics? And the answer to that question is yes. So I divide my medicines into something called high efficacy versus just you know, run-of-the-mill stuff based on statistics. And so I've had experience to know that certain medications, in my opinion, my opinion only for all the people in the back of the room, some medications are more effective than others, or, or some medications I've had enough experience with that I will reach for first when I'm really worried about disability. And with spinal cord lesions, it's when I see that they, after a relapse, they have disability. They don't get better. They don't go back to a baseline anew, and that is their new norm that I now am really worried about the accumulation of disability, and I'll reach for those high-efficacy treatments. Um, have you ever heard of something called MCGAF, McGaff? And do you know what that is? MCG. Because, um, yeah, because I was looking at different things for my daughter for MS. And, yeah, and... Um, I don't have... MCGF? MCGF. I've heard of granulocyte GCSM granulocyte stimulating colony factor, and that's been in talks about for that, but not that acronym. So. It's supposed to be like where it helps cure naturally? Not heard about it. But if I had, I would, and it worked, I would definitively do it. So if they're talking about it, make sure that they've done a randomized controlled placebo trial to prove it. Otherwise, there's really just anecdotal evidence, and you don't know what it's doing. And there's a lot of people out there, to be quite honest, that are preying on MS patients. There's people that are arguing to give you your own stem cells via adipose stem cells, and they're like, just give me $14,000. Well, what you need to know is if you're paying cash, they don't have to show you anything. If you're an insurance company and you have a cardiac stent place, they have to show the artery, they have to show this before the stent, after the stent, and that it's open to get paid. If you write a check to them, they don't have to show you anything, and they can inject water into your spine, which would be terrible, or inject nothing. They can just act like they're injecting something. So keep in mind that there are people that prey on MS patients. And so I often say, I tell my patients, bring it in, I'll take a look at it, I'll vet it, I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do to try and get to an answer on it, but generally speaking, I don't trust them. Yes. You were talking about the methods of diagnosis in the mm -hmm. early 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed in 1958 with a spinal tap. Mm -hmm. That was around the time the Spinal Tap started. It was the 40s where they were doing a lot of stuff. And there was like some really heinous things like the pneumocephalogram where they would do an LP on you, empty out the fluid in your spine, inject air into your spinal canal, and flip you upside down. And it mm -hmm. was like 
most medieval, awful thing I've ever heard of. So glad we don't do that anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> My patients would never come back. The the drug that you were describing that started with the A, element LM2 is a man. Yes. Um, one of uh, my husband's first treatments was one of let's try this treatment was chemotherapy mm -hmm. and basically the same theory with that was to kill off all of those cells and try to build new now is that kind of similar not knowing was was it mitoxantrone that they used novantron do you remember novantron yeah so that was mm -hmm. the idea behind novantron and it it did work the problem was it it was it had issues and cardiac issues and other issues and then we got got cleaner medication so we moved away from it i was at the tail end of it so i i still saw patients who had gotten it but we had pretty much stopped using it by that point because he is basically a no go for any trial because they tried yeah. that on him would this be the same thing? Not necessarily. Um, I would say you need to talk to your neurologist about that, but I, there's a lot of factors that go into play there. So I would, I would talk to them. I would you know, see what the risks are. And my, my biggest opinion on these sorts of things is I, I put the risk to my patients. And if they really want to assume the risk and they understand the risk and they're fully competent people, I, I give them the treatment. That's really where I stand on it because it's not my job. I, me being risky has nothing to do with you and your disease. So why should I impose my fear upon my patients? That's not fair. Right. I mean, he has primary progressive and there was never anything out there. And he just got a stem cell transplant and it seemed to really work for him. Yeah. I've had patients who've gotten a stem cell transplant and done well. Um, the problem is it's ungodly expensive. Um, there has been one death in the clinical trial. And usually what they do is they ablate all your cells anyways and get rid of them and then replace them with your own stem cells. That's generally some of the, the ones overseas that I've actually looked into do that. Yours didn't? They no. um, took it from his abdomen. And the adipose stem adipose, cells. Adipose, yes. And then okay. regenerated them and then put them back in. Yeah, I mean, that's the one I worry about the most because there's no evidence on the adipose stem cells, to be quite honest. I haven't seen any clinical trials on it. There, there are a lot of people selling it. And I think they charge about 15000 16000 somewhere in that ballpark. And he was in a wheelchair and he's walking, so for us it worked. Great. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not one to go against what worked, but my big thing is I just want to make sure it's proven and that we know we're getting what, we, what, what my patients paid for. That's the most important part. Um, I just want to say, um, me, Hi, and you, me and you, you no stranger, so I'm no stranger Hi, to you. how are you? I'm great, I'm Good. great, I'm great. It's Good to see you. Same here. Um, are we going to continue to see some of those slots up there that I see that I've never seen before until tonight as far as the doctors maybe coming out to some program, maybe trying to give us the knowledge of what's going on with these slots and things like that. Are you talking about this? Yeah. Right there. Okay, yeah. I mean, this is the first time that I've seen this type of image. You know, are we as patients going to see any more this type of well, image? There is a difference. This was, I, I made this all on my own. And so whenever I speak for any of the companies in the back of the room, it has to go through the FDA and it has to be approved and they control the deck and it's all that. So. They can put these things in if you ask them to. I would strongly encourage you to give them feedback and, and see if they would add those. Right, guys? Yeah. They're agreeing with that. But these are, these are out there in the literature. These are pulled out of the literature. Okay, yeah, because to me, you know, that's, that's a wealth of information. But the only thing about it is... It doesn't scare you, Shannon? No, no, because sure? I, just, I, okay. I just need to, you know, decipher as to you should have just had the arrow going one way, you know, and just filtering it through, so to speak, to where we can get a better handle on what sure. we're looking at through through that. But my other question was tonight for the first time that I asked you a while back about the spinal cord um, lesions, and that's the first time I ever seen an MRI of a spinal cord, but yet we said that this disease attacks two places. You said that's the brain and the spinal cord, but yet we focus so much emphasis on the brain part, but yet we never see too much about the spinal cord. Well, so the thing about the spinal cord is that its territory is tiny, and so you really don't hide it. The, the reason I worry about the brain is that's the hiding spot for MS. That's where you get the cognitive damage, and we as physicians have done a terrible job in managing cognitive deficits due to MS. So... Uh, 
to me, the spinal cord is what I worry about the most. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward in my opinion in terms of how I look at it and address it. Again, you can ask other people to put slides in there for, of the spinal cord relapse, but I like, to, I mean, I like to show those images. I think it's worthwhile to see them and really see what's going on. Um, so I often tell patients, ask to see your images. It's important. So I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Hi. I have a question about switching therapies sure. um, and about rebound effect. Mm -hmm. So I recently read about Jelenia, when people go off of it, if they don't yes. go on something fast, that you can have a rebound, and is there any ways to mitigate that? So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, one thing we can do is pulse steroid. So what I'll do is if, if I think I need to do a longer extended washout before I go to the next treatment, and I don't want any bleed over of anything interfering with the next treatment, I'll do pulse dose steroids like once a month, give them a gram, just to buy them time to get to the next you know, period and get them on the drug. Plus, even if I started the drug right away, some drugs are going to take two treatments, three months, six months to take effect. So if we're going to make changes like that, then of course planning and really understanding why we're making that change is critical because it's risk. It's, it's really risky. I, I don't disagree with that. So yes, there are plans, there are ways around it, and you know, we, we kind of do the best we can. We still probably don't have the best method out there yet, but we're working on it. Over here, please. Yes. Are there any biomarkers for which medication will help your MS? God, that would make my life easy. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, they're working on it, and they're doing studies as we speak to try and come up with biomarkers to show what disease will respond to what, or even just recognize you've had it or you're responding to therapy. So it's in the works, but we're just not there yet. Isn't like the JC virus a biomarker that's used? Uh, no, because the JC virus tells us that you've been infected, and that's it. It okay. just tells us the risk uh, while you're on these treatments. That's it. I have a better question. Sure. Now that, now that the state of Florida has approved medical marijuana, what's the difference, can you explain, between CBD, cannabinoid oil, and the actual hemp plant THC involved? Okay, so the idea on marijuana is it comes down to two things, right? THC, which is the high, it's the Cheech and Chong, it's the high, and the can cannabinoids. And so the cannabinoids are known as Charlotte's Web in Florida and other places is what they've focused their attention on. There is a drug called dronabinol, which is used to improve um, appetite for cancer patients that we've been wondering would work in this situation. And so when they're recreationally using it, they're after the THC. And when we're trying to figure out how to treat different things, we're after the cannabinoids to really answer that question. And what the study showed, and they just went over this at the CMSC, is that the cannabinoids give the desired pharmaceutical effect and the treatment effect, while the THC raises the possibility of other problems. And if you're using marijuana early in life, before the age of 25 and your brain's fully formed, you have a higher risk of developing psychosis and depression and a whole lot of other problems. So the cannabinoid is where we're focusing and trying to get the direct effect, and that's hitting the cannabinoid or the intrinsic cannabinoid-like receptors in the brain. Thank you. Any questions out here? Great. There was a couple of times sir, that you mentioned that you'd like to get your patients to 60, 70, and you felt you got a home run and you're going on. Is there statistics that kind of show that if you've been relapse-free for several years and you're in your 60s and no more disability and so on? Well, there's no direct evidence. What we've noticed is the patients who tended to get infections and PML and other problems with treatments tended to be the 50s and 60s range, which raised a lot of questions in all of our minds of, well, maybe we're not treating this right. Maybe instead of escalating and starting with the mildest treatment and going to the heaviest treatment, what if we flipped the pyramid and we did the reverse? And what we're finding, and now I've taken 200 plus patients in their 60s off therapy because they've been stable for a better part of five to 10 years, is that maybe on one hand I can count the number of relapses or progression I've seen. So the idea is there that your whole body ages, so why wouldn't the immune system age and calm down naturally if we've allowed it and prevented it from being active? And that's what we're, we're working on. There's no evidence yet to support that theory, but it's a theory that we are all kind of putting to work for us. 
Speaking about age-related, uh, has USF come up with something to uh, fight with the insurance companies about where the insurance companies say that for those that are 55 plus and that they're not showing disease progression but telling them that they're no longer going to cover their drugs because they're seeing that there's no disease progression? How do you get back to the insurance companies and say why there's no disease progression? So, uh, you know... That's an excellent question. It's why I work at the VA, so I don't have to deal with those people. Um, we'll just call them people. We won't call them anything else. Um, I don't have to fight that battle. I leave it to my patients at the VA, which is what I'm very excited about. With the insurance companies, you just make your case that this patient's had aggressive disease, they've had active disease, they're stable. That is a reason to keep them on their drug, to prevent them from getting disability, prevent them from being, you know, using hospital funds. And if you can make it a dollar and cents kind of value, that's really where I focus my attention on and try to let them understand it in terms that they would understand. This will save you money if you keep treating the patient. That's usually what gets it across. And the medical directors is where I go to, is I usually will ask to have a peer-to-peer -peer with the medical directors, and then they'll be like, well, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm one of Dr. Dunn's kids, so I wanted to oh, ask... Oh, Peter Dunn? Ah, uh, Dr. Dunn. He's still there, 84 and still practicing. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesdays and Wednesdays at the VA, you are correct. Um, he comes he's... in and talks to me all the time, and he's like, tell me about that new treatment. Oh, uh, he can walk on water as far as I'm Pretty concerned. Pretty much. <laughs> Is Imuran or Imuran? Imuran. In the same category as teraflumonide? So, Imuran is a generic immunosuppressant and that was never studied in MS. So, there cannot be a direct head to head comparison. Um, it was primarily used for transplant rejection and a host of other things. But it has a more broad effect. And it is actual immune suppressant. It takes out all the cells. It's very, it's something we don't like to use because we get a lot of side effects, problems, liver issues, et cetera, from it. So we've never really gone to that for treatment. It was used back in the day. Dr. Dunn actually was probably one of the first people to start using it when it came out because it was the only thing available. But now that we have 16 approved therapies, it's really not something we use very often for anything. We do use it for a condition very similar to MS called neuromyelitis optica. That's often where we'll see it used because there is no approved therapies for that condition. Before I go around the room any further, um, quick question. For those that are interested in hearing about the stem cells or for those not knowing much about the Lemtrada, can you explain what the difference is between the stem cell therapy and the Lemtrada therapy? So there's several versions of stem cells. One is the one we've talked about where they take adipose tissue and they um, get it to multiply and then they inject that back. Do they give it to you in your spine or do they give it to you in your blood? Okay. Repeat so they that, gave please. It, so he said that they gave it to him IV and in his brain. And so you can deliver it there with the hope that it's going to regenerate. Now, the clinical trials are looking at delivering them IV, and they actually give you medication to get rid of all the rogue cells or the clone cells, and then they're going to give you your own auto-populated um, cells that they've matured in petri dishes and, and replicated and give that back to you to, to suffice as your immune system. That's the premise behind it. Um, that's kind of the area. But these cells that they're using are not adipose cells. They're, they're your own immune cells that they're own, own like, I can't remember the term exactly, but it's your, it's your stem cells from like your bone marrow. Great. Next one. And, oh, wait. You asked me about Lemtrada. So the Lemtrada difference is that we're just not giving you the stem cells. We're ablating the immune system, and we're just allowing your own stem cells to multiply at their rate. So the, the stem cell therapy is a quicker way to do it. Your own immune therapy, or if we do it with Lemtrada, it takes about a year to repopulate all those cells fully. Shannon. Oh. Shannon again. Oh, I thank you. I appreciate that. No, I, I just want to say this is not directed to the doctor, but it's just directed to everybody in the room. When I ask questions, I ask questions for a reason. When I say certain things, I say certain things for a reason. We are all in this boat together. When I'm asking something that's relating to one of my sisters or brother that is suffering with MS, I want to know deep down in my heart because of the fact that I want to know what's going on with them. Even if I don't, even if I'm not in a chair or even if I'm not suffering from any type of chronic disease, I want to know what's going on with them as well. And I feel like I have a right as an MS brother to my MS sisters and brother who's in wheelchairs or whatever device that they have. And I just say that I love them 
And to you, Stu, I appreciate this program tonight. Every question that was asked, every answer that was answered through you, Dr. Gundy. But just like I said, you know, who knows? Like I said, you, you, you might be sitting here in the next MS doctor someday, but you just never know that. But as time go on, I just get filled more and more with my sisters and brothers. So I have every right to know what's going on in their lives. I yes, just, I do walk the streets in camouflage, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and that and that's just me in a nutshell. I love all of them. You know, God bless them and keep them. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Does anybody have any questions? One more over here. Oh, it's okay. Take your time. Just curious, Dr. Gandhi. Um, older, stable, no exacerbations, kind of going on in a couple of years. How often should we be doing an MRI? I'm a believer in yearly to start with. Um, and if I see a degree of stability, then I can space it out to two and then five. And I really just do it based on the patient. Um, as I approach some point at 65, 70, I start talking about your disease has been stable five, 10 years, You're coming off therapy, we'll do one just to kind of fall up, make sure there's no new disease in a year or two, three, and then after that, we kind of knock it off. If you're on therapy and you're doing great, then some, at some point you can argue that it, is it really worth it unless you have new symptoms. But I, I usually, some patients are like, I really want to know, and I'm not going to deprive them that. So there is no hard and fast rule for me. It's a discussion, and what my patients feel like they want to do is pretty reasonable. But yearly is probably the earliest I do it. Can I just add to that? Sure. I was, sorry, I was told that the only place we find gadolinium is in the autopsy. So is it yeah. good for us to be having that yearly? Well, so the argument is that where does gadolinium get into the brain? Well, it only can get into the brain where there's a breach in the blood-brain barrier. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier otherwise. It's too big of a molecule. So one can argue that you would find it in an area of damaged tissue, and if you had a stroke or you had MS or something else, then you would find it on autopsy in that area. Would it cause any effects? To my knowledge, I've done a lot of MRIs on a lot of patients, and I can say that maybe one patient in all that time did I ever wonder if that was a gadolinium um, deposit there. Um, even if there is gadolinium deposit, I don't know how, it's such an inert chemical that I don't even know what it would exactly do, because I've talked to the kidney doctors about it, where gadolinium had its big problem, right? When you had, di when you had kidney failure, you would get systemic sclerosis from the gadolinium, and they completely changed the molecule to make it as inert as it can be, so that they're not even scared of it now. So I've never really seen any after effects, but I do worry and wonder about it. So if I don't have to do it, I'll often leave the gadolinium out. If I'm just doing a surveillance and looking for, you know, just yearly new lesions and I don't think there's an attack, I may argue that it may not be worth it. But as a whole, I try to include the gadolinium to give the most information possible. There's a question up here real quick. Okay. Okay. I, I have a, a real problem. Sure. Where's the gadolinium? You've been, cut, you've been cut off. Sorry. What is gadolinium? <laughs> gadolinium is the contrast that we give you with your MRIs. And that, that is what enhances when you get um, a lesion in the brain. No, it's back. Something I just would like MS patients to know, the last time I had my MRI, I had a fight with the tech because he wouldn't let me wait. And, you know, they tell us we should wait 15 minutes after injection before they start the MRI again. Most techs won't let you wait because of the time. Yes. So I just wanted to tell people, my doctor last time just wrote on my script, please wait 15 minutes after gadolinium given. The other thing is don't let them push it fast. One of them did it to me and pushed it fast and nearly threw up on myself. Yeah, so we have push to slow. speak slow up push. in there, but we need that on the script from but our doctors or they won't. I actually the had that experience, so I commiserate with everybody who gets contrast. It's not fun, but that's I, I was wondering if there was anything, an alternative to uh, an MRI, because I have a lot of trouble doing an MRI. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, just so there's no great alternative to M. Oh. Oh, stand-up MRI. They have the open stand-up MRI, but I, is that your issue? Is that the laying down the issue? I thought you were telling me to stand up, Stu. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's just nervousness. And, uh, you can't sit still. I, yeah, I can't relax. So generally what I try to do is maybe give a little bit of like diazepam Ativan. Try that. 
Okay. So if you can't, then the, really the quality of the study is the question. Now, if you're just looking for new enhancing lesions, you can do a couple quick sequences. It may not be the best quality, but just to look for any enhancement. Otherwise, there really isn't a great thing. I mean, you can maybe get away with a CT scan, but generally I don't even bother with that. All right. Anybody else have questions? We have one more in the front, and that's going to have to be our last one because it is getting late here. I'm telling you, they could keep me here all night, I'm sure. Another MRI, uh, MRI question. Uh, do you do surveillance on the C-spine uh, if there's no evidence, uh, you know, just yearly if someone's had a, a lesion? I'll tell you, I often do C-spines every two years because it's so hard to hide disease there without having new symptoms that I find every two years is about the right number. Um, but if people feel strongly and they're like, look, I really want to know, then I'll do a yearly MRI of the C-spine. I have a quick question considering the talk was uh, about effective communication with your healthcare provider. When a new medication comes about, like most recently, Ocrevus, and it affects, in this case, you know, the pe people with PPMS, is, should it be the um, responsibility of the neurology offices to contact all those with PPMS to let them know that a medication has come about? That's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. Um, I don't know whose responsibility it is. My, my thing is that if a patient's interested and they call, I get them in and we talk about it. That's just kind of the way I've approached it. But when I do see them in clinic and follow up, then I will reevaluate them and tell them about it. Great. Thank you. That's it. Let's thank Dr. Gandhi. Let's again also thank Teva Neuroscience for providing us the funding to do tonight's program. I would like to say thank you to them because we cannot do these programs without their assistance. And whenever we do our other programs around the country that are funded by the other pharmaceutical companies. So again, and the best part is we can't do these programs without all of you here. So I do thank you all for coming tonight.